Chapter 6 A Hero in Kale It was daylight when I was awakened by the sound of stealthy movement nearby. As I opened my eyes, Mula too moved, and coming up to his haunches stared through the intervening brush toward the road, each hair upon his neck stiffly erect. At first I could see nothing, but presently I caught a glimpse of a bit of smooth and glossy green moving among the scarlet and purple and yellow of the vegetation. Motioning Wula to remain quietly where he was, I crept forward to investigate, and from behind the bole of a great tree I saw a long line of hideous green warriors of the dead sea bottoms hiding in the dense jungle beside the road. As far as I could see, the silent line of destruction and death stretched away from the city of Kale. There could be but one explanation. The green men were expecting an exodus of a body of red troops from the nearest city gate, and they were lying there in ambush to leap upon them. I owed no fealty to the Jeddak of Kale, but he was of the same race of noble red men as my own princess, and I would not stand supinely by and see his warriors butchered by the cruel and heartless demons of the waste places of Barsoom. Cautiously I retraced my steps to where I had left Wula, and warning him to silence, signaled him to follow me. Making a considerable detour to avoid the chance of falling into the hands of the green man, I came at last to the great wall. A hundred yards to my right was the gate from which the troops were evidently expected to issue, but to reach it I must pass the flank of the green warriors within easy sight of them, and, fearing that my plan to warn the Kaolians might thus be thwarted, I decided upon hastening toward the left, where another gate a mile away would give me ingress to the city. I knew that the word I brought would prove a splendid passport to Kael, and I must admit that my caution was due more to my ardent desire to make my way into the city than to avoid a brush with the green men. As much as I enjoy a fight, I cannot always indulge myself, and just now I had more weighty matters to occupy my time than spilling the blood of strange warriors. Could I but win beyond the city's wall, there might be opportunity in the confusion and excitement, which were sure to follow my announcement of an invading force of green warriors, to find my way within the palace of the Jeddak, where I was sure Matai Shang and his party would be quartered. But scarcely had I taken a hundred steps in the direction of the farther gate, when the sound of marching troops, the clank of metal, and the squealing of thoats just within the city apprised me of the fact that the Kaolians were already moving toward the other gate. There was no time to be lost. In another moment the gate would be opened, and the head of the column pass out upon the death-bordered highway. Turning back toward the fateful gate, I ran rapidly along the edge of the clearing, taking the ground in the mighty leaps that had first made me famous upon Barzoom. Thirty, fifty, a hundred feet at a bound are nothing for the muscles of an athletic earthman upon Mars. As I passed the flank of the waiting green men, they saw my eyes turned upon them, and in an instant, knowing that all secrecy was at an end, those nearest me sprang to their feet in an effort to cut me off before I could reach the gate. At the same instant, the mighty portal swung wide, and the head of the Kaolian column emerged. A dozen green warriors had succeeded in reaching a point between me and the gate, but they had but little idea who it was they had elected to detain. I did not slacken my speed in Iota as I dashed among them, and as they fell before my blade I could not but recall the happy memory of those other battles when Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark, mightiest of Martian green men, had stood shoulder to shoulder with me through long, hot Martian days, as together we hewed down our enemies until the pile of corpses about us rose higher than a tall man's head. When several pressed me too closely, there before the carved gateway of Kale, I leaped above their heads, and fashioning my tactics after those of the hideous plant men of Dor, struck down upon my enemies' heads as I passed above them. From the city the red warriors were rushing toward us, and from the jungle the savage horde of green men were coming to meet them. In a moment I was in the very center of as fierce and bloody a battle as I had ever passed through. These Kaolians are most noble fighters, nor are the green men of the equator one whit less warlike than their cold, cruel cousins of the temperate zone. 
There were many times when either side might have withdrawn without dishonor and thus ended hostilities, but from the mad abandon with which each invariably renewed hostilities, I soon came to believe that what need not have been more than a trifling skirmish would end only with the complete extermination of one force or the other. With the joy of battle once roused within me, I took keen delight in the fray, and that my fighting was noted by the Caolians was often evidenced by the shouts of applause directed at me. If I sometimes seem to take too great pride in my fighting ability, it must be remembered that fighting is my vocation. If your vocation be shoeing horses or painting pictures, and you can do one or the other better than your fellows, then you are a fool if you are not proud of your ability. And so I am very proud that upon two planets no greater fighter has ever lived than John Carter, Prince of Helium. And I outdid myself that day to impress the fact upon the natives of Kale, for I wished to win a way into their hearts and their city. Nor was I to be disappointed in my desire. All night we fought, until the road was red with blood and clogged with corpses. Back and forth along the slippery highway the tide of battle surged, but never once was the gateway to Kale really in danger. There were breathing spells when I had a chance to converse with the red men beside whom I fought, and once the Jeddak, Kulan Tith himself, laid his hand upon my shoulder and asked my name. I am Dutar Sojat, I replied, recalling a name given me by the Tharks many years before, from the surnames of the first two of their warriors I had killed, which is the custom among them. You are a mighty warrior, Dutar Sojat, he replied, and when this day is done, I shall speak with you again in the great audience chamber. And then the fight surged upon us once more, and we were separated. But my heart's desire was attained and it was with renewed vigor and a joyous soul that I laid about me with my longsword until the last of the green men had had enough and had withdrawn toward their distant sea-bottom. Not until the battle was over did I learn why the red troops had sallied forth that day. It seemed that Kulan Tith was expecting a visit from a mighty Jeddak of the north, a powerful and the only ally of the Kaolians, and it had been his wish to meet his guest a full day's journey from Kaol. But now the march of the welcoming host was delayed until the following morning, when the troops again set out from Kaol. I had not been bidden to the presence of Kulan Tith after the battle, but he had sent an officer to find me and escort me to comfortable quarters in that part of the palace set aside for the officers of the royal guard. There with Wula I had spent a comfortable night, and rose much refreshed after the arduous labors of the past few days. Wula had fought with me through the battle of the previous day, true to the instincts and training of a Martian war-dog, great numbers of which are often to be found with the savage green hordes of the dead sea-bottoms. Neither of us had come through the conflict unscathed, but the marvelous healing salves of Barsoom had sufficed overnight to make us as good as new. I breakfasted with a number of the Kaolian officers, whom I found as courteous and delightful hosts as even the nobles of Helium, who are renowned for their ease of manners and excellence of breeding. The meal was scarcely concluded when a messenger arrived from Kulan Tith summoning me before him. As I entered the royal presence, the Jeddak rose, and stepping from the dais which supported his magnificent throne, came forward to meet me a mark of distinction that is seldom accorded to other than a visiting ruler. Kaor, Dotar Sojat, he greeted me. I have summoned you to receive the grateful thanks of the people of Kale, for had it not been for your heroic bravery and daring fate to warn us of the ambuscade, we must surely have fallen into the well-laid trap. Tell me more of yourself, from what country you come, and what errand brings you to the court of Kulan Tith. I am from Hastor, I said, for in truth I had a small palace in that southern city which lies within the far-flung dominions of the heliometric nation. My presence in the land of Kaol is partly due to accident, my flyer being wrecked upon the southern fringe of your great forest. It was while seeking entrance to the city of Kaol that I discovered the green horde lying in wait for your troops. If Kulan Tith wondered what business brought me in a flyer, to the very edge of his domain, he was good enough not to press me further for an explanation, 
which I should indeed have had difficulty in rendering. During my audience with the Jeddak, another party entered the chamber from behind me, so that I did not see their faces until Kulan Tith stepped past me to greet them, commanding me to follow and be presented. As I turned toward them, it was with difficulty that I controlled my features, for there, listening to Kulan Tith's eulogistic words concerning me, stood my arch-enemies, Matai Shang and Thurid. Holy Hecador of the Holy Therms, the Jeddak was saying, shower thy blessings upon Dotar Sojat, the valorous stranger from distant Hostor, whose wondrous heroism and marvellous ferocity saved the day for Kale yesterday. Matai Shang stepped forward and laid his hand upon my shoulder. No slightest indication that he recognized me showed upon his countenance. My disguise was evidently complete. He spoke kindly to me, and then presented me to Thurid. The black, too, was evidently entirely deceived. Then Kulan Tith regaled them, much to my amusement, with details of my achievement upon the field of battle. The thing that seemed to have impressed him most was my remarkable agility, and time and again he described the wondrous way in which I leaped completely over an antagonist, cleaving his skull wide open with my longsword as I passed above him. I thought that I saw Thurid's eyes widen a bit during the narrative, and several times I surprised him gazing intently into my face through narrowed lids. Was he commencing to suspect? And then Kulantith told of the savage callot that fought beside me, and after that I saw suspicion in the eyes of Matai Shang, or did I but imagine it? At the close of the audience, Kulan Tith announced that he would have me accompany him upon the way to meet his royal guest. And, as I departed with an officer who was to procure proper trappings and a suitable mount for me, both Matai Shang and Thurid seemed most sincere in professing their pleasure at having had an opportunity to know me. It was with a sigh of relief that I quitted the chamber, convinced that nothing more than a guilty conscience had prompted my belief that either of my enemies suspected my true identity. A half hour later I rode out of the city gate with the column that accompanied Kulan Tith upon the way to meet his friend and ally. Though my eyes and ears had been wide open during my audience with the Jeddak and my various passages through the palace, I had seen or heard nothing of Dejah Thoris or Thuvia of Tarth that they must be somewhere within the great rambling edifice, I was positive, and I should have given much to have found a way to remain behind during Kulan Tith's absence, that I might search for them. Toward noon we came in touch with the head of the column we had set out to meet. It was a gorgeous train that accompanied the visiting Jeddak, and for miles it stretched along the wide white road to Kale. Mounted troops, their trappings of jewel and metal-encrusted leather, glistening in the sunlight, formed the vanguard of the body, and then came a thousand gorgeous chariots drawn by huge citadars. These low, commodious wagons moved two abreast, and on either side of them marched solid ranks of mounted warriors, for in the chariots were the women and children of the royal court. Upon the back of each monster citadar rode a Martian youth, and the whole scene carried me back to my first days upon Barsoom, now twenty-two years in the past, when I had first beheld the gorgeous spectacle of a caravan of the green horde of Thox. Never before today had I seen Zitadars in the service of red men. These brutes are huge Mastodonian animals that tower to an immense height even beside the giant green men and their giant thoats. But when compared to the relatively small red man and his breed of thoats, they assume Brobdingnagian proportions that are truly appalling. The beasts were hung with jeweled trappings and saddlebags of gay silk, embroidered in fanciful designs with strings of diamonds, pearls, rubies, emeralds, and the countless unnamed jewels of Mars, while from each chariot rose a dozen standards from which streamers, flags, and pennons fluttered in the breeze. Just in front of the chariots, the visiting Jeddak rode alone upon a pure white thoat, another unusual sight upon Barsoom, 
and after them came interminable ranks of mounted spearmen, riflemen, and swordsmen. It was indeed a most imposing sight. Except for the clanking of accoutrements, and the occasional squeal of an angry thoat, or the low guttural of Zitadar, the passage of the cavalcade was almost noiseless, for neither thoat nor Zitadar is a hoofed animal, and the broad tires of the chariots are of an elastic composition which gives forth no sound. Now and then the gay laughter of a woman, or the chatter of children, could be heard, for the Red Martians are a social, pleasure-loving people in direct antithesis to the cold and morbid race of green men. The forms and ceremonials connected with the meeting of two Jeddaks consumed an hour, and then we turned and retraced our way toward the city of Kale, which the head of the column reached just before dark, though it must have been nearly morning before the rear guard passed through the gateway. Fortunately, I was well up toward the head of the column, and after the great banquet which I attended with the officers of the Royal Guard, I was free to seek repose. There was so much activity and bustle about the palace all during the night, with the constant arrival of the noble officers of the visiting Jeddak's retinue, that I dared not attempt to prosecute a search for Teacher Thoris. And so, as soon as it was seemly for me to do so, I returned to my quarters. As I passed along the corridors between the banquet hall and the apartments that had been allotted me, I had a sudden feeling that I was under surveillance, and, turning quickly in my tracks, caught a glimpse of a figure which darted into an open doorway the instant I wheeled about. Though I ran quickly back to the spot where the shadower had disappeared, I could find no trace of him. Yet, in the brief glimpse that I had caught, I could have sworn that I had seen a white face surmounted by a mass of yellow hair. The incident gave me considerable food for speculation, since if I were right in the conclusion induced by the cursory glimpse I had had of the spy, then Matai Shang and Thurid must suspect my identity. And if that were true, not even the service I had rendered Kulan Tith could save me from his religious fanaticism. But never did vague conjecture or fruitless fears for the future lie with sufficient weight upon my mind to keep me from my rest. And so to-night I threw myself upon my sleeping silks and furs, and passed at once into dreamless slumber. Callots are not permitted within the walls of the palace proper, and so I had had to relegate poor Wula to quarters in the stables where the royal thoats are kept. He had comfortable even luxurious apartments, but I would have given much to have had him with me, and if he had been, the thing which happened that night would not have come to pass. I could not have slept over a quarter of an hour when I was suddenly awakened by the passing of some cold and clammy thing across my forehead. Instantly I sprang to my feet, clutching in the direction I thought the presence lay. For an instant my hand touched against human flesh. And then, as I lunged head foremost into the darkness to seize my nocturnal visitor, my foot became entangled in my sleeping silks, and I fell sprawling to the floor. By the time I had resumed my feet and found the button which controlled the light, my collar had disappeared. Careful search of the room revealed nothing to explain either the identity or business of the person who had thus secretly sought me in the dead of night. That the purpose might be theft, I could not believe, since thieves are practically unknown upon Barsoom. Assassination, however, is rampant. But even this could not have been the motive of my stealthy friend, for he might easily have killed me had he desired. I had about given up fruitless conjecture, and was on the point of returning to sleep, when a dozen Kaolian guardsmen entered my apartment. The officer in charge was one of my genial hosts of the morning, but now upon his face was no sign of friendship. Kulan Tith commands your presence before him, he said. Come. End of chapter 6 Recording by Thomas Copeland Chapter 6 A Hero in Kale It was daylight when I was awakened by the sound of stealthy movement nearby. As I opened my eyes, Mula too moved, and coming up to his haunches stared through the intervening brush toward the road, each hair upon his neck stiffly erect. At first I could see nothing, but presently I caught a glimpse 
of a bit of smooth and glossy green moving among the scarlet and purple and yellow of the vegetation. Motioning Wooda to remain quiet myself, and just now I had more weighty matters to occupy my time than spilling the blood of strange warriors. Could I but win beyond the city's wall, there might be opportunity in the confusion and excitement, which were sure to follow my announcement of an invading force of green warriors, to find my way within the palace of the Jeddak, where I was sure Matai Shang and his party would be quartered. But scarcely had I taken a hundred steps in the direction of the farther gate, when the sound of marching troops, the clank of metal, and the squealing of thoats just where it was, I crept forward to investigate, and from behind the bole of a great tree I saw a long line of hideous green warriors of the dead sea bottoms hiding in the dense jungle beside the road. As far as I could see, the silent line of destruction and death stretched away from the city of Kale. There could be but one explanation. The green men were expecting an exodus of a body of red troops from the nearest city gate, and they were lying there in ambush to leap upon them. I owed no troops were evidently expected to issue, but to reach it I must pass the flank of the green warriors within easy sight of them, and, fearing that my plan to warn the Kaolians might thus be thwarted, I decided upon hastening toward the left, where another gate a mile away would give me ingress to the city. I knew that the word I brought would prove a splendid passport to Kale, and I must admit that my caution was due more to my ardent desire to make my way into the city than to avoid a brush with the green men. As much as I enjoy a fight, I cannot always indulge no fealty to the Jeddak of Kale, but he was of the same race of noble red men as my own princess, and I would not stand supinely by and see his warriors butchered by the cruel and heartless demons of the waste places of Barsoom. Cautiously I retraced my steps to where I had left Wula, and warning him to silence, signaled him to follow me. Making a considerable detour to avoid the chance of falling into the hands of the green man, I came at last to the great wall. A hundred yards to my right was the gate from which the 